joining us. Um, we're going to get started in just another minute. We're going to give participants one more minute to log on, but thank you again for being here today and we can't wait to get started. It's okay. Hey everybody, if you're just joining us, we're just giving everyone another minute to log on, but thank you again for joining us today. We're going to get started in just a moment, but uh, once again, thanks for joining us. Hi. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for being here today. I see a lot of familiar faces. I also see some new faces. So um, it's great to connect with all of you. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and do some introduction. So I'm Amanda Garcia. I am the director of the digital design, public relations and digital media marketing programs here at Tulane SOPA. Um, in the upper left hand corner, this is my email address in case you would like any information on our programs or just to connect and ask any questions um, as follow ups to this. Uh, but I would also like to introduce our panel today. So first off, we have Kay Vassy. And as soon as we stop sharing our screen in just a little bit, you'll see full photos of everyone. But we have Kay Vassy with us. Um, she is a senior, senior technical advisor, or I'm sorry, animator. Wow. Uh, of Epic Games. And uh, you may remember Kay from last semester whenever she was here with Epic Games and they did that fabulous presentation at Tulane. So we're so happy to have her with us again today. Also, Liz Monty Cook is with us and she is the owner, lettering artist, designer extraordinaire of Lionheart Prints. You may be familiar over on Magazine Street. If you haven't been in Lionheart recently, you should definitely check them out. Um, well not right now. Not inside the store, online. Check them out online. <laughs> yes. Um, also, we have Barrett Conrad with us today. He is the owner and interactive developer of Contina Soft. I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly, but we'll let Barrett make sure he corrects me. Um, we also have Nancy Miller on with us today, and she is the owner and creative director of In Miller Creative, and she's also an educator. Um, she also started her career at Nike and brings a ton of wealth of design knowledge to this conversation uh, today. So we just thank all of you so much for being here and really look forward um, to this. Okay, so we're going to stop sharing the screen so that way we can see each of our presenters. Awesome. So the way this is going to work is I'm just going to ask a few questions. We'll have a conversation. If you're interested in asking any of the panelists any follow-up questions or if anything pops into your mind as we're kind of going through this, feel free to put in the chat. It's at the bottom of your screen, a little chat bubble. Um, feel free to type any questions that, or follow-ups that you may have. And then either during the conversation or at the end of the conversation, um, we'll make sure to address as much as we can with our panelists. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Liz, I'm going to start with you, if that's okay. Um, so like everyone on our panel today, you were uber successful in what you do. Um, you, we all started somewhere, right? Can you tell us a little bit about like where you began your creative career um, and kind of some of your early, um, early career choices that kind of led you to where you are today? I think um, it's better to frame it in the uh, a lack of career choices that I had available upon graduation because um, I graduated uh, the University of Oklahoma in 2008 with a, a degree in journalism emphasis in advertising which was hilarious because there was no jobs in advertising to be had. I had a big dream of being an art director like working my way up in ad agencies um, starting as a graphic designer wanting to become creative director and um, I could like feel them laughing when I would send my portfolio over. Like, little girl, there's no jobs here. I don't know what you think is happening out in the world. But um, so I um, 
it was pretty depressing time. And I had just moved to a new city with my college boyfriend, now husband, but um, we joked that he got the last job in the economy and thank God he did because he brought us to Houston. Um, and I just ended up working a bunch of part-time random jobs. So um, I worked at restaurants at a Montessori school. I worked at a chocolate shop. I worked um, eventually at Paper Source in, um, in a fancy part of Houston and I fell in love with it. I realized that um, there was a, a niche for people who had a sense of humor and uh, were into graphic design, but also retail. And it was just kind of a, you know, there were, all the Venn diagrams were, were, had me right in the middle and I was very excited about it. I was also doing comedy at night. So um, bringing everything together felt like, okay, this is a thing that people can do. And every time I, we would restock cards, I would see, you know, a turnover the back of each one and I'd read a little bit about the company and it's like, these are just people making them in their house or in small studios. Like this feels like an attainable way that I can um, use my skills and not get lost in the crowd and use my voice for something that means something to me. Um, it took a lot, a long time from that realization to um, starting the business in 2013, but that was definitely, it was just about following my enthusiasm and finding things that might not have been like the career answer at the time, but um, could braid together to become uh, what I really enjoy doing today. That's interesting. I had no idea you did comedy. That's really cool. And yeah, I mean, definitely all of the things that you just mentioned, you bring into your visual story now, right? And into the personality of your store. And I think that's, that's something really interesting to point out. I think the students need to understand is that all of these experiences, whether they are directly related to what you want to do, any internships, any part-time jobs, all of those things ultimately inform who you become, right? And there's awake and just be aware and when you find that little bit of excitement and you're you know you get goosebumps because you're excited about what you're doing follow that that's the rabbit that you should be chasing that's awesome i'm going to pitch this to Kay as well because Kay, i know that um your career is very different than what um liz is doing right so you're on the gaming side of things you're with epic games which is a huge huge company and um i'm sure that you didn't just start out doing that right so can you tell us about your like early career journey and how you got to where you are. Okay. Um, well, so I, I sort of started around 11 years old and um, that's when I decided I wanted to be a Disney animator. And so everything up to, you know, from there to college was people telling me, don't be silly and uh, sort of going, forget you. Um, I'm going to do it anyway. And so uh, I'd always been interested in art and, um, you know, coming out of high school, uh, I had been accepted at all these art schools, Ringling, RISD, CalArts, all these places for my portfolio, couldn't afford a one. So I ended up going to an in-state school in South Carolina, Clemson University, and sort of cut a deal with the art department to allow me to have the art education that I felt that I needed, um, as well as supplementing with film, drama, computer programming, and all the things I sort of knew um, were coming. You know, this was, this was 90s. Um, I'm a little bit older. So this was pre-internet. I didn't have the internet until I got into college at all. And so um, didn't have a computer until then as well. And that's really, you know, I went to art school, I got out, I thought I knew what I was doing. Um, I moved to Orlando to get into Disney and found out I actually didn't know how to draw. And so then it became um, a, all about the side hustle. And so I was doing like used car logos in 3D, uh, you know, like rotating Exxon logos and stuff for local TV commercials, news graphics, uh, newspaper graphic design while I was getting up at 5 a.m. every morning to draw, uh, literally drawing ice skaters that I was re recording on VHS tapes during the Winter Olympics and just like doing gestures and everything until I got into Disney. And so, yeah, from there it was, it was um, basically making friends and knowing people and that moved me all the way through to uh, DreamWorks animation for 11 years. And then uh, once I was kind of, when movies were sort of dying out, I jumped over to games and have been at Epic for six years. So 
That's awesome. I think yeah. something that you said is really important. I mean, everything you said is really important, but one thing I want to point out that I think we probably all could agree that we've experienced and it's really important for students to understand is that, you know, coming out of school doesn't mean you have all the skills that you need, right? Nope, not and, at all. Yeah, and I think acknowledging that and acknowledging that learning is a, I know this is, we hear this a lot, but learning is a lifelong process, but honestly, it really is, right? Understanding that there are gonna be things you don't know, there's gonna be things in the profession or your profession that you will need to learn on the job and or like you said, pick up in a side hustle, right? Um, and you have to keep working at that, I think is really important. You know, upon graduation, you're just not armed with every skill you need. I mean, I know in our program, we are really aligned with the workforce and we try to prepare students, but there's things you're gonna learn on the job. That's why internships are so important, you know, and all of those things that you just don't know what you don't know, right? And I think that's really great. Right you took that extra step to keep honing those skills. That's really important. Yeah. Um, yeah, Liz. I also just want to emphasize that it's okay to not know things. And I think um, the, the separation between good interns that I've had and, and not great interns that I've had and the kind of intern that I was, uh, was uh, people who pretend like they know everything and people who are hungry and are like vulnerable and ready to say, I don't know how, but I want to know, and I want to know the right way. Can you help me? And I think that is the, if you can develop one skill in your life, it's to say, uh, it's the excitement to learn something that you don't know. That's awesome. That's really, really good advice. Barrett, can you tell us how, um, kind of where you started in your career journey that kind of led you in the direction you are now? Um, sure. My, my career journey in some ways starts way, way before college. Is that I, I come from, I'm born and raised in Arkansas. My entire family was in real estate and real estate development. And so like everybody was independently employed, ran their own business and everything. So that was, that was my path. It was, uh, didn't want to do the real estate thing, but I was like, I'm going to own my own business. So I always was aiming at that. You know, I went to college with the assumption I was going to go get into games. This was a little bit in the 90s. <laughs> and um, got into college and did computer science. I'm a little, me the boring one here because my, my career path is basically almost a straight line to, from one to the other. And so uh, went to Tulane School of Engineering uh, and got a degree in computer science. And so but once I got out there, I, mean, I took a bunch of art classes and physics classes, assuming I was gonna go you know, get into gaming and um, kind of just looked at the industry at that time and said, I don't think I wanna go. Um, I didn't like where it was at and said, let me go see what else is around. But I knew I wanted to stay in New Orleans and I ended up finding a job um, here at um, actually Children's Hospital writing software. And so software is all I've done my entire career. And so I was two years at Children's Hospital, and then I went four years into uh, another local consulting company that, you know, wrote software. And, you know, I kind of, you know, found out I really liked working directly with people. You know, it's not in technology. It's very easy to say that it, it's, you can assume a lot of it's at a distance, but there's a whole huge amount of work. And almost exclusively what I've ever done is working with people, I building things directly for them. And so, um, you know, I got a taste of that and kind of said, um, well, I was, I think I could do this a little better myself and uh, I always knew I was headed that direction and just doing my own thing and uh, went on my own at a relatively young age of 28 <laughs> and uh, been doing it ever since. So I think that you know the experience though that you gained from working with Children's Hospital and then the other development company though I think you know a, a huge misconception that a lot of students and I know I also made was I'm going to graduate and go out on my own right and I think working for somebody else for a little while and I, I see everyone nodding their heads it's on our panel you know having that experience and understanding once again there's so much that you don't know about working and running a business and maybe you know even though you knew all along you wanted to start your own company and work for yourself and work with people i think acknowledging that you should have that real world experience working for someone else i think is super valuable right um i absolutely. see everybody nodding yeah absolutely that's great um nancy can you tell us kind of how you got started where your creative career began uh sure so i got my undergrad in graphic design in fort worth at tcu and um whenever i graduated um, my boyfriend at the time, had, we, we decided we wanted to go somewhere different. So we went to Oregon, Portland, Oregon, we thought for like a short term. And um, initially I worked at Hollywood Video Corporate. So if y'all remember Blockbuster and Hollywood Video, 
if you went into Hollywood video, all the graphics hanging from the ceiling, two for five popcorns, that was my gig. So it was very production heavy. It was not glamorous. It was tedious. It was file crunching. I did that for a year and then Hollywood video um, went under. And then I went to a packaging company where I did packaging for um, some big brands such as Home Depot and Burton Snowboards. <laughs> Excuse me. And um, I did that for a year and um, ended up actually at Nike. So Nike is based and headquartered in Oregon. And um, I started out in socks. So I would do packaging for socks. Um, I would do internal presentation graphics. I would do um, sales kits. I would do things called tech packs, which is like factory drawings and, you know, kind of schematics. And from socks, actually, I was recruited into the team sports department. So every, everything that you used to play team sports, baseballs, uh, well, basketballs, baseball bats, all of those things, I did the graphics for those things. Um, so I was at Nike for about three years, and then my husband's job actually brought us to Corpus. And even though I'm from East Texas, I'd never been to Corpus. Um, and I went to Corpus, and I started out an advertising agency. And so I'd always been in-house at a, um, you know, for the, the jobs that I had had in design. And so working in-house as a designer is very different, and for a brand, it's very different than working in an ad agency. When you work in an ad agency, um, it, you have to switch gears all the time. You juggle a lot more. You wear so many more hats. Um, but honestly, it was, very, it was a very, very uh, challenging change. But I ultimately think it was probably the best thing I could have done in retrospect because working in an ad agency pushed me to be, to be all the things I wasn't comfortable with, copywriting, um, web, um, digital, all the things that I was initially kind of afraid to touch, um, I had to just do. I had to jump in with two feet and just own it and learn it. And so I did, um, I ended up as a creative director in that agency eight years later. Sorry, I'm like having an allergy attack. Um, <clears throat> it's okay. And um, I ultimately actually, um, Amanda was living in Corpus at the time and they were trying to recruit uh, new faculty for the, the program she was launching for the graphic design program. And I just made a decision that as much as I loved advertising, it was, it was a beat down. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a lot of hours. It's a lot of stress. Um, and I had, you know, little kids and I was just ready for a, a more family friendly um, career. So ultimately I went into um, higher education and um, I worked with a, a faculty, as a faculty member alongside Amanda. And then um, when she moved to New Orleans, I kind of stepped into her position as the program coordinator there. So my career is very, very, the spectrum that I've, the jobs that I've done is very diverse. Um, and in all the jobs I did, um, I would just have to, I would just go in and try. So every single job that I was at, if someone came to me and said, can you do this? I would figure it out. Um, and I think that that willingness to try and that willingness to, um, you know, attempt things that maybe other people were unsure of or, you know, unfamiliar with kind of helped me to be super flexible as a designer um, and ultimately really helped me expand into a lot of different positions um, that, you know, I never would have thought I would have been able to do when I started out in design 20 years ago. So um, design can take you a lot of really cool places. Um, I know people that do very unexpected things with their degrees in design, but it's taken me into some really, taken me through some, through some great jobs and then landed me where I am today, which is working with students, which I ultimately love more than anything that I've ever done. So um, it's, been a good, it's been a good ride. It's, it's, it wasn't always smooth, but in the end, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy I, I did it. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. And I will also point out too, that you wouldn't be as an amazing educator as you are if you hadn't gone through all those other experiences, right? If you hadn't worked in house, if you hadn't worked for a big agency, I mean, all of those things, once again, kind of like Liz and Kay and Barrett, like all of those other jobs and all those other experiences inform what you're doing now, right? In such an awesome way that make you like so great at what you do, you know? And I think that's really important for everybody to understand is you know, that broken road, right? Or that crooked path ultimately is going to better inform and make you just a stronger leader, you know, wherever you end up. I think that's really important. Um, speaking of ups and downs, 
I know that, you know, right now our economy is kind of in a down, but other than that, other than the economy and like job opportunities, can I'm curious from the panel, if you can think of a time in your career that you just felt creatively drained, right? Or creatively down where maybe I see Liz, we'll go back to Liz. I see her <laughs> making a face uh, where you maybe just like weren't as motivated, right? I mean, I know I get like that. Students get like that. Like, what do you do to kind of push through? Or can you think of an example of a time when you were just sort of like, I don't know what the next step is. How do I move forward? Liz, do you want to take this one the beginning? I feel like I'm in it right now. Um, <clears throat> I'm really saddened and frustrated by so many things in the world at large. And all of my work is very emotional. I mean, I design greeting cards. I, I, am, I am here to bring a voice. For, I'm here to, to create words to help you say what you need to say to whoever, say things to yourself, you know, through art prints and other products and things. And um, I have been just zapped of all creative energy um, recently. And I've been really in a, a social media spiral. Um, but reconnecting with nature is really important to me and taking good care of myself physically is, uh, is an, a crucial part of um, my creative health. So like going for walks, um, I went to the river this weekend and um, you know, that was, that was like church to me. I feel so much better and, and I'm actually able to do a lot more this week um, with a clear head. And um, being the leader for my team right now, uh, making sure that they don't feel, because uh, it's really scary on Magazine Street right now. Like businesses are closing every, every week. There's another business that's going down and it's scary for my team. Um, and you know, I need to be the leader that um, makes them not worry. And I said to them yesterday, I was like, I look at my orchids right now. I love plants. I am like a big plant lady, but I really, really love orchids. And don't ever throw away an orchid. If I catch you throwing away an orchid, we're going to have some words. Um, because orchids, people think that they're dead. They're not. They've just lost their flowers and they're going into a dormant phase. And that's okay. That's part of, it's part of them using their energy to rebloom. And that's what I am thinking about a lot right now. I am using my energy in, a, in an efficient way so that my heart doesn't keep breaking at everything that I'm seeing, um, but that I'm also making the work that's meaningful to what I need to say, but also right now as a white one, this is not my time. I'm taking a lot of like steps back to just let other voices be heard. Um, so this is my time to be dormant and that's what I need to do right now. And, um, I and so that. I think it's just being awake, being aware and, um, don't get yourself too deep into a pigeonhole. Make sure that you're, um, paying attention, but not letting it, um, get you down. That's, that's really good advice. I mean, I think, you know, all of us on this, this panel today and all of our guests are very creative people. And I think when you are creative, you do have heightened emotions, right? I mean, it's that, that idea that like we are putting ourselves or we should be putting ourselves in our work, right? And even if we're doing work for clients. I think you have to be an empathetic person in order to be creative. Absolutely. You can't translate things into a form that others can appreciate if you're not digesting the emotions. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And so I think that makes us more sensitive, as you're saying, to yeah. these things that how do we bring our voices to this and when do we and when do we not, right? I think that's that's true, you know, and I'm sure a lot of people on our call today are also struggling with that. So that's, I love the analogy of the orchid. That's really beautiful. Make something with that. I love it. <laughs> I want that. Awesome. Kay, can you think of a time um, when you felt maybe creatively drained or when you just needed that motivation and kind of what helped you through that? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, my career has been um, all about deadlines and all about crunching and all about getting things done. Um, you know, there, there were times when I was working on movies. Uh, in particular, I remember uh, Shrek 3. I was doing visual effects and it was just all I could do to go in. And, you know, it was, it was, I was uh, up against a really difficult visual effects supervisor and, you know, my work just wasn't good enough for that guy. And it takes its toll, like all of the feedback and everything really takes its toll. And sort of the way that I got through that and the way that I typically get through sort of creative dead zones is 
sort of, for lack of a better phrase, like artistic schizophrenia. I sort of always have a painting somewhere or a drawing somewhere or music somewhere. Um, I also play bass. And so it's like, I will take time away. And it took me forever, forever to realize how important time off is and being able to walk away and say, I'm at a point right now in my career or in this project where I'm being damaged by it. And I have to step away from that. And I will, I will send those energies to other things, right? Either, either creative or not. Um, family as well. But when it comes to sort of reinvigorating the creativity aspect, um, I'll, I'll go do something that I'm terrible at, like painting or, or watercolor or something crazy like that, or try to learn a new song on bass or try to try to play. And um, that's kind of how I recharge and refill my, my batteries, I guess, is the best way to say it. Um, but I, I think that it happens to everyone. I think everybody who's an artist experiences those, those dead zones. And you just have to recover. And sometimes you just have to go away and relax and not do a thing and then come back at it with fresh eyes. Yeah, I see Liz. Liz snaps it out. Yeah. I'm okay, saying I need to hang out when this whole thing is over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Yeah, it's hard, right? I mean, as creators, as makers, it's hard for us to give ourselves the space to take quote unquote time off, right? Um, you know, my husband used to give me a hard time and he would say, you need a hobby. I'm like, I, hobby is work. Like all I do is work. Right. I mean, I think we all fall into that trap where we enjoy it. But then I think something else that you said, that's really important is you said, you know, it was, you worked for someone who was demotivating, right. Or added that stress level. And I think that we all need to realize that whether we're working in groups as students or, you know, when we're in the workforce, and even if you're not the boss and you're working with a team, I mean, I think we could all agree, I'm sure Barrett as well, in his company, attitude is everything, right? I mean, bringing a negative attitude into a work environment, once again, even if you're not the leader of that team, <laughs> yeah, Liz, I see you, <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it affects everyone. It affects productivity, it affects creativity, and I think because once again, we are very emotional, we are very connected to one another in these teams, you know, and I think understanding that, you know, those aren't the type of people that you want to work with. Don't be that person. But also, you know, um, I forget, uh, one of my students had an internship a few years back and said, you know, I just, I can't stand it. We were working for a, a billboard company in house. And he just kept saying, it's a horrible experience. It's a horrible experience. Everybody's so negative and all I do is, you know, try to, and I said, finish the internship, but understand that now you know the type of environment you don't want to work in, right? Like take from these negative experiences, things that then you can see in yourself that you don't want to be, or now you know the type of place you are looking for, for the next position, right? I think maybe like carry over those things. So those toxic environments, man, they can, they can really get you down and they can really stifle your creativity. So I appreciate you bringing that up. I think that's really smart smart point. Um, Barrett, how about you in your business? You know, this idea of these ups and downs, do you ever for your team, I mean, do you ever see that people kind of hit a wall and how do you help push them through that? Oh, uh, so there's, that's a, that's a slightly different question. We, uh, <laughs> we actually, when you hit a wall, we have a, a friend of mine actually used to write software in Japan and he said there, uh, they had a mannequin in the middle of the office. And if you had a problem, you went and talked to the mannequin. <laughs> just, just talk it through. Okay. So that's what we do at the office. I'm like, do you need to talk to the mannequin? Just just talk until it comes out. And 90% of the time I go, I got, I'll be back. <laughs> and all is well. But as uh, you know, I think that that's um that's ultimately I think that that I was I'm very on in line with what Kay was saying is that although it's slightly a variant of it is my advice is walk away. It's walk away, it is okay to walk away. Um permanently even <laughs> like it's just a pro it's a side project like a painting you don't like whatever just leave it you know you don't have to finish it i think sometimes we get compelled to finish that stuff and that's actually harmful but i you know i say walk away go do something else do something very else different that you actually like not because it's just go do something different it does get your mind out of it but it also i am a big advocate of go to something else that you like your other thing and let 
focus on it to let it influence what you're actually trying to do, you know, actively and productively, maybe professionally. You know, I personally, you know, I've been a software engineer my entire career, um, but I cook a lot. I have had more epiphanies about both doing the other thing than it, than what I'm doing it. Like, I, uh, and I, so I think that that just getting your mind out of it and letting it, you know, you know, be free to think about things and wander a bit will actually get you a lot further than just, you know, pounding, you know, head first into things. I, I tell staff all the time, just take a step back. Hitting it harder will not help. And, um, you know, I think that give your, just do something to get yourself to sort of um, learn some other way. It will help you understand and think differently about what you're doing and kind of help you get through it. That's really smart. I think that's really good advice. Um, yeah, I agree. I think definitely even in the student realm, Nancy, I was going to pitch it to you for students, you know, when kind of following up on what Barrett was saying, you know, when you see students hitting that wall, right? Um, and you know that they're capable of more and you just, they're not able to break through, right? Um, the idea of, of walking it off or taking a break or doing something differently. Is there anything else maybe for the students on the call today that you could recommend that they could do? You know, I think students, Sometimes you have to understand, especially in graphic design, you're typically serving the business goals or the visual goals of others. So your job as the graphic designer is to, you know, create things that communicate visually to the target audience on behalf of your client typically. So you have to learn to separate yourself from the work sometimes. And especially sometimes students, you know, in the, in the classroom environment, you're getting feedback from your peers and from your professors and you don't necessarily have to take every piece of feedback and integrate it into your work, but you need to understand other people's perspectives about your work. So sometimes I think the best advice for students is to let it go. If it's not working, let it go and push yourself to try to find other solutions because that's extremely important training for working in client environments. Um, as I'm a huge advocate of, you know, obviously don't let people walk all over you, but I also think students really need to understand that, you know, you're going to not get along with some clients. You're going to not get along with people you work with. Um, your job as a visual problem solver is to satisfy your client while coming up with a solution that you can be proud of that is also effective. And sometimes it's not going to be the solution that you maybe want to put out that's 100% you. So I think you really have to learn to be somewhat flexible. Um, especially when you're talking about um, working with people. Um, and I think ultimately that will take you very, very far um, as, a, as a designer, whether you're working for yourself or you're working you know, with a team or a group. I think people that don't understand how to see other people's perspectives and other people's kind of um, the way that they interpret work, it, it really is a, it is a detriment because so many designers that I know are extremely talented but you know, they have bad rep, they have bad reps because they're difficult to work with. And I don't think it's that they're necessarily difficult people, but they don't know how to push back, you know, the appropriate amount. Um, so I think it's really important that, you know, if you do, if you find yourself stuck creatively, I think really try to maybe take some of the feedback that you are getting from other people and really digest it. And maybe, and even if you don't like what they say to you, like, oh, I, I hate those colors. Well, maybe that's not, at the heart of it, it's more like the colors aren't um, resonating with the target audience. And why is that? So I really do feel like designers, I mean, we, we get very attached to our work. We think everything we do is amazing. I feel it. It's ego. I mean, we know we have it. But you really have to learn to be understanding and accepting of other people's perspectives. It's extremely important in design, and it will take you very far. That's really good advice. Yeah. And I think you're right. Like there's definitely that balance, right? Like how far do we listen to our peers, et cetera, and, and how much of it do we need to follow what we want to do versus what the client's asking and that sort of thing. I think that's really important. That balance is really, really important. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of education, right? I mean, we're here on behalf of Tulane Sofa today. And, you know, like I said earlier, we try to align our classes as much as we can with the workforce, but like I said, there's those soft skills. There's a ton of things that you're going to learn on the job. And I'm just curious from you guys, like, hey, I'm going to pitch this to you first. Um, you know, can you tell us a little bit about your education? I know you hit on it earlier, your educational experiences and how you feel perhaps like that shaped where you are today or with what you maybe wish you would have uh, maybe done differently in your educational experiences? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I think I did pretty well. Um, I think I had an uphill climb, but I think that if you're going to take the route that I took, you've got to be sort of hungry and you've got to know what you want and, and at least have an inkling of how to get there. Um, 
I would also say outside of a school context, as far as like, e like you know, education and career, um, you cannot stop hustling and you have to keep learning and you have to do it with absolute humility. You always have to understand that there is someone out there better, smarter and more effective doing what you're learning to do. Seek them out and be as nice as possible to them and, and set up that relationship to learn. Um, a quick example, after I left Disney, I was moving to Chicago to work for Big Idea Productions on um, one of their movies. And um, the role that I was switching from a fine artist to was writing code, which I had supplemented my degree in college with C++ and some, some computer science. And so, you know, I, I went up for the interview and they were like, can you write in this language called Perl at the time? And I was like, of course I can write in Perl. Like, what are you talking about? Of course I can. And I'd never done it before in my life. And on the bus or on the, the, the moving truck up to Chicago from Orlando, I learned how to do it with a laptop and a book and, and multiple books. And he sat and when I wasn't driving, was doing the tutorials and going through everything, learning it. So that when I got there and got into the technical group, the, the render TD group, um, I knew enough to have a dialogue and I knew enough from my educational background to have a dialogue, but I was able to go, how would you handle this? I think I would handle it this way, but I don't know if that's the best way to do it. How would you? And that sparks an educational conversation that not only bonds you to the person as a friend, but a coworker and sets you up to learn and them to help you. And understanding how to make that happen is extremely important um, as you continue to educate through your entire career, not just in school, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. Now, that's really, really great advice. Yeah. Um, Liz, can you talk about your educational experiences? Um, I know one little thing about you that I'm so jealous that I still want to do one day is your trip to Italy with um, the best of the best. Can you talk maybe about experiences like that and how, how you made that happen and how that's kind of informed where you are today with your lettering? So uh, yeah, um, 2014 I got um, to go study um, with the School of Visual Arts in New York uh, in Rome for two weeks with uh, Louise Healy and Stephen Heller and Lita Tallarico and just, it was like um, a, a world-class lettering calligraphy immersive experience, which was absolutely a dream come true. But I have to say like um, the way that opportunity um, came about was from projects that I had done that opened the door to that even being remotely a possibility because um, as, a freelance graphic designer, I certainly didn't have the 10 grand just sitting around to pay for the, the school, pay for the trip. I guess I was working at a consulting firm at that point. I had, anyway, um, if you follow the, the little breadcrumb trail of things that you're supposed to be doing and, and the, like, I, I'm really big on following your enthusiasm. And for me, um, it's a, a longer, journey to get to that trip, but um, I was doodling on airplanes every time I, okay, got to take, I'm sorry, Amanda, that you know this is a little bit of a longer you have time. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, this is your, go for it. Okay. Um, I had just started Lionheart Prints in 2013, and I had put out a few cards. Some of them were minimalist and typeset and Futura and shit, and then some of them were hand lettered. I didn't know that hand lettering was a thing until people were like, oh, you're a lettering artist. And I was like, what is that? Um, and I started following, I mean, I think it was like kind of when that trend was really getting popular. And I started following this artist from Australia. Her name's Gemma O'Brien. She's amazing. She's a calligraphy or a calligrapher and illustrator. And her work is incredible. Um, so illustrative, so different than anything I've ever I've seen. And she would do this thing when she would get on an airplane and every time um, she would fly, she would take a sick bag and illustrate, hand letter a vomiting pun and it was hilarious and I was like what a cool challenge how can I do something similar but in my own way um so every time I was like well every time I fly I'll just letter the name of the city or state where I'm going 
and I'll only have the time with the tray table and I'll post it when I get to the gate. When I was going to my first little um, conference about stationery, and so my first, the first leg of the trip was to Oklahoma to go see my mom, did one there. The conference was in Dallas, did one for that leg of the trip, did this two day conference and quickly realized how little I knew about this like new business that I had just started. And I was feeling really um, very small and um, um, I didn't have a website. I had this sad little Etsy shop. It was, um, I, I, I was, had a big ego about what I was doing and then I, it was quickly squashed in that two day workshop um, until one of the leaders was like, well, show me your portfolio. And I was like, what? portfolio. I have like five things. Um, and, um, it, she's, I, I just had like a few things on Instagram and she was like, you're a lettering artist. This like the, um, please go do that. You have something special here that nobody else is. Uh, this is your voice. Like, please develop these skills. And I was like, oh, okay. So the next day I flew home to New Orleans and I did a New Orleans piece. And it was the first time that something that I had posted like, like got a lot of likes and like it seemed to resonate with people and a local t-shirt company licensed it on the spot. Um, and that was pivotal because that t-shirt, that this little doodle on an airplane turned into a t-shirt that paid for me to go on this trip and really learn um, in a, in a deeper way, what I really want to study. And meanwhile, I'd been taking lots of workshops and all these other things. But the coolest part is that of the 15 people in the entire world who went on this trip and were studying together for two weeks, Gemma was there and, uh, we became really good friends. And I got to tell her this whole story that like, I'm here because she inspired me. And now, and we like went off to Capri together and like, you know, we're, we'll be friends for life. And it's just, when you follow the little breadcrumbs and you listen to people who are have your best interest in mind, um, I think that's where our intuition and, and destinies can really come together to, to push us in the right direction. Thank you, Sam, for saying that you weren't sad. I mean, we are kind of sad. <laughs> that's a really amazing story. And I think that just further reinforces what you're saying with the breadcrumbs is that all of these different creative journeys that we're all on lead to something, right? Whether we, we see it now, which we probably won't, but whether we see it or whether we don't see it, it's all ultimately leading us where we need to be. If you're listening and if you're making those decisions. If you're and listening following. and not listening to your ego. Yeah. That's a hard one, right? Like, how do you, how do you separate that? You learn. Yeah. You, you got to learn for when, uh, when the inspiration is coming because of external validation mm -hmm. or something really deep inside. That's really smart. And I wonder, you know, Nancy, maybe you can speak to this too. Like, how do you develop that? How do you, how do you recognize that in yourself? I think that that's might be the most important thing we're talking about today is how do you recognize that voice of telling you where to go next? Right. I mean, a lot of our students are coming to us from different career paths completely, you know, and they've listened to their creative voice saying, like, do this, like, this is something that interests you. And they're in our classes. Right. But for those of us who maybe like aren't there yet, like, how do you how do you separate like like listen, like the ego and what the external world is telling you and find like what you really want to do? Um, you know, I think it's, it's very hard, I think, to listen to your creative voice. I feel like it's definitely not a strength of mine. Um, I think in, in my opinion, I think students have to uh, recognize an opportunity and learn to separate the idea of opportunity from the perfect situation. Um, there, maybe you don't see yourself working in an ad agency because you want to be an independent designer look at that opportunity as an opportunity to meet people, to work with clients, to, um, you know, be even, even um, maybe you are yourself are a graphic print designer. That's your, maybe that's your passion. Well, maybe getting exposed to somebody who is more of a copywriter or someone that is digital will show you how those skills are utilized in the, in the real world. And that may spark something for you. Um, I just think that students really need to just appreciate an opportunity as an opportunity and not look at, look at it as the next step and like the, the, the end all of, of their careers. You know, you can go through many different positions within your career 
and you never know which, which um, job is going to lead you to what you truly want to do. So I would just um, always encourage students that you may love um, team sports and you may love team sports branding. I have a lot of students that really want to work in team sports branding. Um, specifically like, you know, for major, um, like baseball teams. And that's, it's a, that's a wonderful field to be in. It's extremely selective and there are very few positions available. So instead of being like, this is my one and only narrow path, instead students need to understand, well, you know, I may not be exactly in the realm that I want to be in, but branding for clients is still branding. And the skills that you'll learn, maybe if you were doing branding for more in a corporate setting, um, will translate for you to where you ultimately want to be. So I th definitely think that you need to just appreciate an opportunity as an opportunity um, and take advantage of that situation and just recognize that it may introduce you to people that may take you to different places, um, give you skills that may broaden your skill set and help you be more, you know, flexible for, the, for other jobs. So I just really think students should just not be not just not be ultra picky. I mean, in, in reality, you know, I, the first job I did, like I said, not, there was nothing sexy about it. Not, not a bit, but ultimately it helps me, you know, meet some great people. It helps me kind of get my foot in the door for the next position that was a great, was a great position. So I think just, I would not be afraid to, to say yes to something that you're saying is not the perfect opportunity. But no. also recognizing the distance between what that opportunity is and where you want it to be, and let that motivate you to find, to be able to recognize the next opportunity is like the next closer opportunity to getting to point Z. Yeah, absolutely. Right. It's not a direct path. Right. It's not a direct path. It would be so boring if it was. <laughs> but uh, to Liz's point, I think there's a lot uh, to be said. If you if you recognize somebody that you you know really look up to in the field that you're interested in reach out to them, try to find a mentor that is related to where you ultimately want to be. Because I think that there's no better um, understanding of what that, what that could possibly look like than actually talking to somebody who is living it or who has been through the process and it could help you get through the process quicker. So I don't think students should be afraid to reach out and you know um, make contacts and network with people that are, that were ultimately you're gonna help them you know, find their path. That's great. No, that's great. So we only have a little bit of time left. So lightning round. Um, <laughs> I want to ask each of our panelists, um, if you could give students just one piece of advice, something that you wish you would have known maybe when you were in school, uh, that you know today, what would that be? Okay, so Barrett, I'm going to start with you first. Uh, and then we'll open the floor for any questions at the end. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I have a thousand answers to this until... <laughs> Uh, you asked it. Um, I think it really, I'm going to go back to what I said before and just embrace, embrace all those other things around you that you do and know and value those things. Um, I'll, I'll give the example of this is that there are a lot of people now, um, a lot of opportunity in technology software development. People want to get into it fast. They end up with like code schools and things. I always see, and they can send me their resumes. I always get a flurry of them whenever they all graduate together. And I look at them and I go, you went to a code school. All I see on here is code that you've done, but I know you've had three jobs before that. And you need to realize that as we've talked about opportunities, it's not, a, it's not always just like you may have, you may get these design jobs and there may not be the perfect one, but even those other jobs that you don't, that aren't in that, that you did on the side just to pay the bills and make a big difference. I look at all those and I go, I know one of you is a cashier somewhere. And that matters to me as much as anything else because you've got customer service, you know how to deal with things on the fly, value all that stuff. That's, this, that's part, this is kind of a soft skill conversation, but I really think is value all that other stuff and you know pay attention to it because it will serve you as well as any of your technical skills that you learn sort of along the way. Absolutely. Yeah, those soft skills, man, those are equally as important as all the hard skills. We hear that consistently from employers. Some of them actually are hard skills, though. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Okay, how about you? Um, I think for me, quite simply, is uh, to stay humble at all costs and to stay hungry at all costs. And between those two things, you're going to make friends and you're going to have good and bad experiences, but all of those good experiences are going to amplify and when you need it the most, the people that you worked with two companies ago or two jobs ago are going to be there to lift you up 
um, if you are humble and, and, you know, are still hungry and uh, have made friends and have really, you know, blossomed in whatever you're currently doing. That's great advice. Nancy, what about you? One piece uh, of advice. I was going to go back to being hungry, which I think is one of the best pieces of advice you can definitely give somebody um, graduating or a prospective student. Um, I think just really be open to, um, you know, immersing yourself more with groups of people and in, in the field that you want to be in. So if you have your eye on a specific field, you know, really try to educate yourself about what the opportunities are in that field, um, especially like if you're talking about locally or if you're talking about nationally, regionally, really try to educate yourself as far as what, what, is that, what does that market look like and what would be your best approach in trying to get into that market. I mean, in some ways you have to treat, you know, kind of your path. I mean, there's a, there's a planning element involved. There really is. And I know not everyone knows exactly what they want to do, but I think if you're considering something, you know, one of the best things you could do is just to, to really kind of it, to investigate it, you know, and really look at what does that look like? And, you know, what would I need to do to be competitive in that space? And how do I, um, you know, essentially pad my odds so that I can really, you know, reach my full potential or accomplish the goals I want to accomplish. So I think there is an element of planning that really does help you, um, you know, have a higher success rate. And I think that it, it's definitely worth your time and worth your effort. Great. Thank you. Liz, last but surely not least, can you tell us what a piece of advice you would give to students? Um, no one's a silo. I will hire somebody who is less talented, but is a better, um, ha is a better team player over um, the most talented designer. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking back to like being in college and, you know, w looking at my um, fellow students as competition for the, the small amount of jobs. And that was totally the wrong way of looking at it because, um, yeah, there's lots of talented designers out there, but if they're not nice people who aren't um, filling the rest of their world with interesting um, experiences to bring to the table, then um, they're, they're not gonna have a very long career path. So I would say um, be just as excited about what you're doing um, in your field as you are outside your field and um, it, everything's all connected. So don't, don't shy away from putting that the cashier experience or you know your other hobbies in there because there's a lesson in everything and uh, it just makes you a more well-rounded and um, valuable team player. Yeah. Can I one, sorry, can I make one comment? Yeah. So as somebody when I was in advertising, you know, I was on the other side of the hiring table. And so I would always, you know, be reviewing portfolios for, you know, up and coming designers. And I 100% agree with that. I always looked at those, um, ex like the responsibility levels that people would have even in those retail jobs. So they showed me, oh, you start off as a cashier and now you were manage a manager at HEB. Or, you know, maybe they had a history of those types of patterns where they showed that they had leadership abilities, team, you know, team, um, team leading abilities. So I think it's really important to understand that that experience is not discounted. Um, and that that can be very beneficial to you because it often, Liz is correct. I mean, if it comes down to two applicants that have the same uh, skill set, technical skill set, it's often going to be, you know, who seems to have the best personal skill set that's going to be a good component to the team and, you know, work well with the group. So, no, that's absolutely. We do have a question for Kay. Um, do you have any tips for putting together a concept art por portfolio? Concept art, um, sure. Uh, the important thing about concept art is being able to sort of view an asset, let's say it's a character, um, from all angles, um, understanding your material breakups, uh, how what things are metal, what things are cloth, what things are leather, how that's going to feel, as well as making sure that the character is fulfilling some sort of uh, fantasy for the player that you're expecting. Um, you know, every video game in the world has crates in it or a barrel in it or something like that. And um, it's actually uh, really good to see somebody take something that's mundane like that as well in a portfolio of all this other cool stuff that you've made and actually show all the different styles that you can hit 
because if you're working in a game studio and you have a style that may fit a game, but it may not fit the new game that's coming out that's going to be bigger than the one you're currently on. So you really want that that breadth of design, color theory, all the things you're learning in school that you're probably going like, oh, this is hard. Do that really well and show it. That's really great advice. Absolutely. I love that. Barrett, that kind of, you know, leads me to another follow up. Um, what do you look for when people come to you? I mean, we have a lot of our students in our program and I know students out there graduating with like UX degrees, UX, UI, right? Looking at maybe the front end of design. They know some of the back end. Maybe they're not on the software side, but for just, you know, for some of our students who are on here today uh, who may be graduating in our interactive UX, UI track, what would you, what do you look for in those portfolios? Oh, goodness. Um, I think <laughs> um, I think I'm kind of going back to the ego and, you know, uh, humility on this, because I think for what we do, we do so much of our work is, you know, kind of it's for clients and things that there's a practicality to it. That's the word I'm looking for. Uh, I see, I've seen a lot of things over the year. They're really a uh, high concept that I, you know, I get and follow and I see all the theory of it, not to discredit anything Kay just said. I just think sometimes people overfocus on that and I go, but this is, you know, there's no practicality here to it. And so I think um, <clears throat> that's a big part of it. But, you know, I want to see somebody that's willing, you know, feedback has been a common thing here. Um, I would, rather than see something, I, um, I am more interested in hearing how people talk about their job. That's the number one thing I, I, I listen to whenever I interview somebody is how they talk about it. Can you have a conversation about it? Can you explain to me how you got there? I'd rather see something that, you know, is super boring, not interesting, but they tell me about it and they tell me the story of how they got there and different rounds of feedback and different things that they disagreed with that then turned around and said, oh, that didn't end up working well. Like that's the thing I'm much more interested to see than a particular, you know, um, Maybe like understanding the process, their process. the process and realizing that it is a process. Right, um, absolutely. Then, the, I didn't say this earlier, but it's uh, one of the things that I think we don't do well to prepare, prepare kids um, for um, students for the real world is we have this idea of like you get one shot at it. You've mm -hmm. got to write a paper, you write the paper, you turn the paper in, it gets graded, you get told what it is. That's the first thing I try to get out of anybody. It's like you've got to show this work early, you got to show it often, you got to keep iterating on it and, and taking in the, the can you know, the real world constraints, the feedback and all that other stuff, you'll get to a much better product there. So under, understanding the process, yeah, is really the thing I would be looking for more than anything. Really. That's great. That's really good feedback for students to know when they're putting together a portfolio. That's really great. Um, we have, uh, we're almost out of time. We could take one more question from Emma. She says, do you have any recommendations for where to start in regards to being unsure if she wants to work, let's say for the corporate side or, um, in an agency or maybe, you know, that sort of thing. Like, how do you, how do you know, how do you decide where to start? Anybody want to take that one? Okay. I thought that I wanted to be in the ad agency world. I thought that that was the, the dream job for me um, because that was all I knew of the height of uh, graphic design of what I wanted, of what I had been shown. Um, I am so grateful that I couldn't get a job in that um, in, in agencies um, in 2008 because I also knew deep inside that like showing up at eight o'clock in the morning every single day is not a skill set of mine. That's just not who I am and it's never going to be, but doing intense work um, that and just kind of going like, I know that I'm a pretty independent person. And um, I can I can make it in in somebody else's um, world for a while, but I knew deep down that the most success that I would have would be when I connect my own voice to um, the work that I'm doing. And so I think that for me, it was it was knowing just that's my truth. Like, yeah. Well, knowing what you're gonna excel at, right? I think that that's. And also, Nancy, did you want to say something? Oh, I'll just, I mean, for my personal experience, I would t always tell students that um, advertising will teach you how to be extremely flexible, fluid, and because you're, you're expected to do so much and to, be, to touch so many different, you know, media for so many different clients. So it's, it can be a very um, intensive learning experience. 
But I will say, um, just from my experience, if you if you are wanting to really um, hone like technical skills and really like flush out your design abilities, going in house in a corporate setting is going to give you the opportunity to kind of work at a more reasonable pace. Um, I think to be part of and then when you go work in a corporate environment, you have one client, like the brand is the client. So you get to really focus on like owning that brand's voice, um, communicating that brand visually. And when you are working in an advertising agency, you have multiple clients. And so you do have to, um, you do have to adjust faster. So I think it really just depends on what your, what your preference is, is do you like that fast pace? Do you, do you, do you like the idea of kind of really, you know, it's, it's really a, but those, that's definitely my um, experience as far as the difference between those two types of environments. Um, they're both really great experiences for different reasons, but ultimately it's, that's kind of, I feel like the difference between the two. Yeah. And I would also say too, you know, maybe getting an internship, Emma, in one or the other and just seeing yeah. how you feel about it. Well, it's not a long-term commitment. So, I, I think you can actually understand what you like better by doing it the opposite way and figuring out what you don't like. I think mm -hmm. if you want to just corporate's hard, but agency, you can go figure that out by go doing a little bit of contract work for somebody that you know, doing, you know, yeah. logo design for them. Just try it. Get three or four clients at a time and go, do I like this? Because you'll know if you don't, you don't want to do it all day. <laughs> That's, that doesn't change much whether you're doing it for a couple or a whole bunch and how much you're being paid. You're still dealing with people and all the things that go around it. So. Also, take note of what you do when you're procrastinating, because oftentimes that is what you ought to be doing most of the time. Love it. Yep. And it turns out I really like shopping. So having a retail store was a very good fit for me. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's great. And it's well, funny to say that because I'm like drawing right now while I'm listening to you guys. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you all so much for joining us to our panelists for taking time out of your day. Um, I know you guys are all very busy. So thank you so much. And thank you for everyone for joining us today on this call. Um, this is being recorded. Uh, so we will definitely distribute it to you guys if you would like to, to follow up and listen. And this is on the screen right now. You can see our social media. Feel free to check us out and um, you know, kind of follow our student work that's on there. And if you need any more information, this is our website. So thank you guys so much again for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing y'all again in the future. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.